But if you have your Bibles open to the book of Proverbs this morning, I've been preaching on blessings and curses. And in this series, I first of all just talked about the blessing and what the blessing was, the blessing in Abraham's life and uh, how, I don't know, I just, I believe God wants us blessed. And then, then last week I talked about the law of reciprocity, which is sowing and reaping and giving and receiving and blessing and receiving blessings and speaking well and declaring and all that good stuff. And so this week I want to conclude it by talking about the purpose of prosperity because God really gives us prosperity, and I'm going to define it here in a second. I'm really going to talk about what it is and why it comes. But why does God give his people prosperity? There's a purpose behind it. Amen? So let's just read one short verse, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. So what exactly is prosperity? Prosperity is not simply having a lot of money. Prosperity is not just being famous. Or prosperity isn't just accomplishing a lot in life. Prosperity must go biblically deeper than that. The Bible says in Revelation when Jesus was sending a message to the Laodiceans, he told them, he said, you're saying that you're rich and you have all that you need of. You have nothing else. But he said, I'm telling you, you're poor, blind, wretched, miserable, and naked. You need to come to me and buy stuff that's everlasting so you can have money and be miserable. Proverbs 13 says, There is one who makes himself rich yet has nothing. And there's another who makes himself poor yet has great riches. Ecclesiastes 5, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This is also vanity. So there's nothing wrong with having material possessions as long as they don't have you. I remember hearing the story of Deion Sanders, who was one of the greatest professional athletes of, of our time. He, he was one of the few ever in history to play two professional sports at the same time, played professional football and professional baseball. And he said he remembered winning the Super Bowl and driving off, I think, in his Ferrari and going back to his mansion and being the most miserable person on the planet. And he realized that that didn't alone buy him happiness, that it took something more. Amen? So what really is biblical prosperity? I'm going to just define it just as simply as I can. I, I just believe being prosperous biblically is living in God's blessing. Well, i got two amens. I just believe it's living... In God's blessings. I believe it's living in God's blessings. Living under the spout where the glory comes out. <laughs> Had to say. Hallelujah. Somebody been raised in church. Praise the Lord. I really, living under the flow of his blessing and walking in all that that means. Because Jesus said, I have come to give you life and Life more abundantly. One translation says, and life to the full, full throttle. Life to the full. I've come to give you life and life that's lived out in all of its purpose and all under my blessing and under my favor. Amen? I believe that's what God wants for our lives. Now, it's interesting. I never really connected righteousness and holiness with biblical prosperity but it's all through the scripture because if you look at the lives of Adam and Eve they had to be the two most prosperous people ever on planet earth they knew no sin they're living in a garden they had everything at their fingertips they're eating fruits and vegetables they didn't have to farm and they're just living it up right God told them, be fruitful, multiply, take dominion over the earth, go do all that and more. And God just blessed them. But when they sinned, it broke the prosperity in their lives. 
it really damaged and crushed it. Now they're going to have to go out and live a different way and were thrust out of the garden and God put flaming cherubim or cherubim with flaming swords to guard the way so they couldn't get back in. So really the level that they were living was broken because of sin and disobedience. As long as sin remains, poverty won't go. You can be rich and still poor spiritually. You can be living life in the eyes of the world to the fullest, but if you're not living under the blessings of God, I don't think you're living a biblically prosperous life. Well, 2 Timothy, Paul said, The foundation of God stands having this seal, the Lord knows who are His, and, quote, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's living under the blessing of God where sin has been brought under the judgment of the cross and sin has been atoned for and then the power of sin has been broken out of your life. And I I guess I never looked at it like this before. We always think of sin in terms of judgment on sin. But I started looking at sin in terms of prosperity, that really if you're living in habitual sin, you're not living the prosperous life God wants you to live. You're not living up to, can I say it this way, up to the standard of blessing that God wants you to live in. You're really not living in the standard of blessing if you're walking under the bondage of certain sinful behaviors. So what... What does it look like to be blessed? What does it look like to walk under the blessings? Psalm 1 says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the waters that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. That's the prosperous man. One who is living a righteous life. Psalm 92. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. And they shall be fresh and flourishing. I'm going to read that verse again just for Hans. They shall still bear fruit in old age, and they shall be fresh and flourishing. Let's stop saying we're old and worn out. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Say, I'm, I'm 85 and fresh and flourishing. Praise God. I'll just turn 60. Great. 60 fresh and flourishing in Jesus' name. (laughs) To declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in Him. Proverbs 14. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 13. Wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished, but he who gathers by labor, by honest means, will increase. Ezekiel 36, when God was calling back the nation of Israel back to the promised land, notice this, he says, On the day that I cleanse you from your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities and the ruins shall be rebuilt. So there's a, there's a, a, a colliding of two concepts here. I'm going to cleanse you from your iniquity and rebellion and I'm going to bring back the prosperity and blessing in your life. You're going to come back into Israel and inhabit your houses again. Genesis 17, when God came to Abram and reiterated the covenant promises, and he came to Abram several times and reiterated the covenant and then expanded the covenantal promises. And this time he says, when when Abraham was 99, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am Almighty God. And that term is El Shaddai in Hebrew which has something to do with provision, we believe. It's kind of a mysterious Hebrew word, but it means the many-breasted one. So we believe it has something to do with provision. 
And then he says, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. Here's total provision with righteous living. 1 Timothy 4.8, bodily exercise profits little. But godliness, godliness, godliness is profitable for all things. Proverbs 14, fools mock at sin, but among the upright there is favor. There's favor to the upright. One bishop said, every prosperity is traceable to victory over iniquity. Think about it. Joseph prospered because he wouldn't fall to the temptation of Potiphar's wife in Potiphar's house. And because he held his integrity, God was able to use him and call him out of the prison and take him to the pinnacle of the kingdom and save his family, save the nation of Egypt, and save the future covenant people of Israel. And it really hinged on his integrity and his righteousness when he went through trial after trial. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So God really wants our heart. First thing, He wants us. He wants our heart. He doesn't just want your money. He wants your heart. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, My son, give me your heart. Give me your heart and let your eyes observe my way. 2 Chronicles 16, The eyes of the Lord go to and fro to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. The blessed man is a righteous man. The blessed man is the man whose heart belongs to the Lord. The blessed man is the man who walks in character and integrity according to the laws of God. We don't hear these connected and preached. I don't know if I've ever heard a message on this, but I'm preaching one now, bless God. So you know we can talk about prosperity and blessing. It has to be connected to righteousness and and getting the iniquity out, the power of sin being broken over your life, and living the laws of God as you should. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what is biblical prosperity? I believe it's walking in the blessings of God. It's walking in the favor of God. It's really, let me just say it. In modern society, the secular world is focused on self. I think it comes out of the Enlightenment era. And we focus on the self and how the self can be enhanced. And so so Christianity, to some extent, bends in the world toward all about the self and all about the fulfillment of self, self self-actualization. And then we get into a concept like blessing and prosperity, it all becomes about money. It all becomes about how I can get wealthy. Whereas biblical prosperity is so much larger and so much deeper and so much greater than all of that. And one of the greatest lessons you can learn in the kingdom is this isn't all about you. It isn't all about us. We have a dear family in our church. I shouldn't say these things, but it's 11 o'clock and I don't care. We have a dear family in our church and the husband, who's a great man, but he was saying something about something he didn't like at church going on. And his wife looked at him and said, hey, it ain't about you. I'm done. Drop the mic. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, hey, 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 it ain't about you. (laughs) Let me give you three facts as to the purposes of of, of, of biblical prosperity in the Christian realm. Three purposes of biblical prosperity. First of all, God blesses us to walk in his favor. He, I believe, some of us don't have this concept because we've been inundated with a false teaching that You know, God wants us broke, poor, depressed, and sick. I don't believe any of that. I believe God wants us to be blessed so that we can be able to bless others. God wants us to walk under the canopy of His favor. Okay? If you look at the Old Testament term for blessing, it's the term barak, which just means God causes someone to prosper. It means to be happy. It means to be supremely happy. It means to be enriched and loaded down with His benefits. It means to be enriched and loaded down with the benefits of God. Amen? 
So get away all the other thinking and just think of what the Bible says. Abraham was blessed. Jacob was blessed. Joseph was blessed. Come on. The, the Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Noah. All, just walk through the patriarchs and the early men of the Scripture. They were just blessed because they walked under the canopy of His favor, obeyed what God told them to do. Can you shout amen? amen? So to be blessed, to be supremely happy, enriched with benefits. There's a, if you read King James, there's, there's scriptures in the Old Testament talk about being fat. And it's a good thing. Not talking about fat, but talking about fat. Fat in the spirit. Loaded down with the blessings of God in the spirit. Oh, hallelujah. I was going to say, turn to your neighbor and tell him I want to be fat, but I'm not going to do that today, okay? Because some of y'all are going to freak out. But anyhow, it's fat in the spirit. It's loaded down with the blessings of God. Come on, somebody. Shout hallelujah. So open the Bible and open your Bibles and turn to Deuteronomy 7 with me, and I want to show you something. Now, this was the, Deuteronomy is the second telling of the law before Israel was to go back into the promised land. So Deutero means second. Namas means law. So it's the second giving of the law. Moses is talking to the children of Israel, and he says this here in chapter 7, verse 12. Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep you, will keep with you the covenant and his mercy which he swore to your fathers. Why? Because you listen to his judgments and do them. So there's a condition placed upon this, and that is you obey what God says do. And you obey his principles, and then he's going to bless you. And what's going to come out of this? Notice the next verse, 13. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you and bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain and your new wine and your, your oil, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock in the land which he swore to give your fathers. You shall be blessed above all people. There shall not be a male or female barren among you or among your livestock. There's going to be this general abundance in a physical, tangible way. I'm going to bless your livestock, your children. You're going to be blessed. Then it's interesting what he says next. He says in verse 15, And the Lord will take away from you all sickness. The Lord will take away from you all sickness and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of, the, of, of Egypt which you have known, but will lay them on all those who hate you. So not only is there this incredible abundance, but God's going to allow them to have health. The next thing he says is then also, verse 16, you shall destroy all the peoples whom the Lord your God delivers over to you. And he goes down and he talks about that delivering capacity for the next several verses. And then he talks about don't fall into idolatry and to sin and all this and turn away from the Lord. So the deal is, He's telling them how he's going to bless them. And as I see it, this comes in three basic categories. First of all, there's this general abundance that God promises he's going to give the people. And then he says, I'm going to bless you with health and healing. And then he says, I'm going to defeat all the enemies from you. Now, if we're talking hermeneutics, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with Old Testament covenantal language? Does it mean anything to us in the New Testament? We could just wash it away and say it means nothing, but I just can't do that. I believe that we are tied into the covenantal blessings of, of, of Abraham to some extent because we're grafted into the promise, and Paul talks about it in the New Testament. So I believe, if for nothing else, that God just sets out some precedent as to how he blesses people, if nothing else. So if we just look at that, either we're tied into the blessings of Abraham, or at least he sets precedent on how he blesses people. Either way, I'm going to hold on to it this morning. Amen. I'm just reaching in for my life. Amen? So let's look at it in three ways. Number one, he brings abundance. Number two, he heals us of all diseases. Number three, he promises deliverance from enemies. And we know they were attached to the land. Covenantal promise was tied to the land in Israel. It's not so for us. But I see in the ministry of Jesus and in the apostles, deliverance comes in the form of spiritual deliverance from sin and demons. 
that in the New Testament there's no demonic force that is able to stand in front of Jesus or the disciples. They all are defeated. So could we say that we have to live under the canopy of God's favor and blessing means to live under the spout of abundance. That God's able to bless us. He's able to bless the work of our hands. He's able to give us creative ideas. He's able to give us favor in the workplace. He's able to bless our work as we we go. He's able to bless our giving. He's able to bless the law of reciprocity, all the laws of the kingdom. Boom! Then number two, we walk in healing. Why? Because I have New Testament foundation for that as well. Jesus healed all who were sick. Numerous times He healed everybody who was sick. The only places He couldn't heal sick were His hometown of Nazareth. He said He could only heal a few folk because of their unbelief. New Testament, Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good, healing all of those oppressed of the devil. By His stripes we are healed Matthew says in Matthew chapter 8, in the context of Jesus healing the leper, healing the centurion servant, healing Peter's mother-in-law, and healing a mass crowd of people in a healing service one evening. I hate to have to walk. I don't hate it. I'm working through all of this stuff to bring you to a point of proving something that I believe when we walk under the... I'm just going to say it. When we walk under the canopy of God, we should be walking under His abundance. When we walk under the canopy of God, we have access and should be walking in divine healing. When we walk in the, under the canopy of God, we walk with the power source to blow out all of these strongholds of sin, demonic forces in our lives so we can live truly free up to the standard that God wants for our lives. Hallelujah. I'm about to get happy. I mean, I'm already happy, but I'm about to get happy. You know what I'm saying? Second thing that, that the purpose of prosperity is true prosperity comes so that we can bless other people. He told Abraham, God did in Genesis chapter 12 verse 1, I'm going to bless you. And then I'm going to bless those who bless you. And I'll curse whoever curses you. And in you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So in other words, when everything was falling to pieces, Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 11, judgment, 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 God called a man by the name of Abram and he said, now I'm going to bless your life and I'm going to pour my favor into you And you will be a blessing to other people. I'm not just blessing you so you can have a lot of cattle and a wealthy existence. I'm blessing you for a purpose to be able to bless other people and to help some other people out in this life and to be able to provide for future generations who will carry on my covenant promises. And this thing's going to get so big that you, all the nations of the earth will ultimately be blessed through you, which we know is a prophetic word concerning the coming of Jesus the Messiah Himself. So God comes to bless you, and, it, and, and He wants you to enjoy the blessing, but He comes to bless you, and it always has purpose for others wrapped up in the package. Proverbs chapter 11, The generous soul shall be made rich. He who waters shall also be watered. Proverbs 3, do not withhold good from those who, who, to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do so. You should be generous. Proverbs 19, he who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord and he will pay back what he has given. Proverbs 22, he who has a generous eye will be blessed for he gives of his bread to the poor. Matthew 10, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received freely give. Matthew 25, I was hungry and you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer and say, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and gave you drink? Or when do we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when do we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to Me. So it's taught all through Scripture that we are to bless and we are to share and we are to give. And when God blesses us, He does it with a purpose to give others. And it's not just money. If God gives you a gift, it's to use it 
to bless somebody else. If God gives you a talent, it's to use it to bless other people. If God gives you ideas, it usually involves other people in the ideas. If God t- blesses you to work, it's usually so you can work and help society out, help your family out, which helps other people help other people. Help other people. Look at somebody and say, help somebody. <laughs> Come on, it's all wrapped up in the blessing. You know, even the gifts of the Spirit don't come so we can just label ourselves apostle, prophet, evangelist. No, they come. If God gives you the gift of evangelism, guess what? It's for lost people to preach the good news to them. If God gives you the gift of of teaching, guess what? It's for people so you can teach them the Word of God. If God gives you the gift of of a prophet, it's so you can encourage and exhort other people through the prophetic word it, it, all of it comes we're just conduits and God moves through us to bless other people it's the same thing with your bank account it's not a hoarding account it's a blessing account that you're, you can bless people you can bless people oh hallelujah oh hallelujah Oh, hallelujah. So we live, and you know what? The more you grow in that, the more it becomes just a living reality to you that this is how things work. Because the natural mind fights against those things. The natural mind thinks there's only so many resources in this earth realm. And so I'm going to get all that I can get and hoard it up as long and as tightly as I can hoard it up. I'm going to be tight as a tick, and I'm going to, be, I'm going to squeak when I walk. Because if anybody else gets some of that, it means less for me, and I won't have anything. Okay? That's called a poverty mentality. Okay? I'm going to preach to this church. It's called a poverty mentality because you're not recognizing God as being in anything. It's all you, and you're the king, king of your life. But when you recognize that everything comes from Him and that He's the source of all blessing, then you recognize if He hands out another billion, heaven ain't going broke. If he gets my brother out of debt, it doesn't mean it's going to take out of my paycheck in the future. I mean, it's not like God, you know, he's only got three cattle left on the hill. No, he owns a cattle on a thousand hill. It's like, no, there's only so much gold left. God created all of it. Come on, man. I believe he can supply all of it. And once we get him as primary, it's a faith thing. To give is a faith thing. Every time you give tithe, it's a faith thing. I'm going to sign the check or I'm going to debit it out of my account electronically and God, it's yours and hallelujah. I'm stepping out on faith believing it's all yours or give a big offering and let that big offering go. And you're like, oh, wow. God, it's yours and I'm just going to trust you. And then once you do that and you step out on faith, God gets in motion and you're going to receive a harvest and God's going to come back and bless you because you've given and you've blessed somebody else. Hallelujah. Come on, raise your hand and say, I am the blesser. Come on, say it one more time. I am the blesser. You have the power to bless those around you with your words, with your action, with your encouragement, with your finances, with your gifts, with your talents, with your artistic ability, with your ideas. With all of it, we have the ability to bless other people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know the life of J.C. Penney? Am I showing my age here? I'm young and prosperous and what did it say? Flourishing. Thank you. Fresh and flourishing. But anyhow, J.C. Penney, you know, I guess J.C. Penney's still around. Thank you. <laughs> but J.C. Penney got to a point where he gave away 90% of his income. You think 10's rough. He gave away 90% of his income. I always thought that was the coolest thing ever. The coolest thing ever. I worked with a, a bishop who uh, was, a, was an amazing supporter of evangelism, world missions, people to people, children, all that. And he, and he told us in one of our meetings, he said me, and he's a very meticulous, detailed numbers guy. He said me and my wife just made it to, our, just made it to 20% on giving tithe. We're on our second tithe. 
and guy was nearing retirement age and had been a preacher all of his life. I know, an, I know a missionary right now who lived, has lived on a missionary salary, which isn't much, and he owns a home in his missionary country and owns a home in America, both paid for, sent all of his kids to college, and people have told me he gives away a lot of his paycheck to help other missionaries. A lot of times we blame stuff on the devil or God's principles didn't work because we've just been lousy stewards of the finances and resources God's given us. Don't blame that on God and don't blame it on the devil. It was, uh, it was you. I'm a nice guy, really. I'm just being straight. It was, a lot of times we blame stuff on the devil that's our own stupidity. Well, God, I tithe, but I've never seen the blessings. But I went to Walmart and bought everything I could see. <laughs> then I had to have everything in sight. Well, the Bible also teaches stewardship. It also teaches investing. It also teaches saving. It also teaches taking care of your parents. It also teaches taking care of your children. It also teaches being so blessed that you take care of your children's children. You take care of your children's children so they're blessed and they have a future. That's, a, that's the biblical understanding. You know, sometimes we've had such a, golly, I'm teaching, what am I doing? We've had such a religious mentality of I'll fly away, oh glory, that we didn't think about living here. I'm just going to move to the next point. It's getting, y'all going to need wading boots to get any deeper in here. Third reason prosperity comes. Listen, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Next chapter over in Deuteronomy. Third reason prosperity comes. He says, you'll say in your heart one day, don't, Moses is teaching the children, said, don't, don't get to this point. God knew it was going to happen. The prophets are declaring it later on. This is what happened. But he's saying, you're going to get over in the promised land and don't say, my power and might of my hand have gained me this wealth. Because God knew the greatest enemy and the greatest temptation of receiving blessings is pride. It's the greatest, I believe, I believe it's the greatest enemy is pride. I did it. Look how brilliant I was. Look how hard I worked. Look how great I did it. Look how I figured the system out. It's the greatest, bless, it's the, it's the greatest enemy of the blessing is pride. That pride can creep in and you forget who gave you the ability to produce that wealth. So he says this, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. It is He who gives you power to get wealth. It is He who gave you the heart that's beating in your body. It is He that gave you the ideas ro rolling through your mind. It is He that gave you the blood coursing through your veins. It is He who formed you in your mother's womb. It's He who, who gave you the ideas that caused that money to start flowing. It's He who gave you the technical ability that you use every day. It's He who gave you the ability to, to, to teach and get in there and instruct kids every day. It's He who gave you the ability to wire houses and businesses every day. It's He who gave you the computer knowledge and the systems knowledge that you have. Come on. It's He that gave you the banking knowledge that you have the electricity knowledge you have and you have. It's He who gave you the knowledge at the shipyard to be able to do all that you do. It's He who gave you the knowledge in the Navy to be able to do your work. Come on, somebody. It's He who gave you the farming knowledge to be able to do what you do. It's He who gave me the ability to be able to speak and depend totally on the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. It's He who gives you the ability to write insurance policies every day and help people in their life. It's He who gave you the ability to teach and love Duke basketball. God bless you. Hallelujah. It's He who gave you that ability. It's He who gives you the ability to weld every day when you go out. Come on, somebody. It's He who gives you the ability to drive trucks and to, to lay brickwork and to be a stonemason. And It's He who gives you the ability to raise a garden that 
ain't stopping no time soon. Amen? It's He who gives you the ability to be a Coast Guardsman or be a painter or be an artist or be a, a song. It's He who gives you the ability to get wealth. He's the one who provides it. Government didn't give you that. State of North Carolina can't give you that. It has to come supernatural. Hallelujah. It has to come from heaven. He gives you the power to get wealth. Don't forget it. The downfall of Israel was when they thought, we did this. And and when you get to that point, people go stupid. I'm telling you, when you get, when money has you, and you think, then you think you're in control, and you go stupid, then you want to become a king. Then you want to have your kingdom. Then you want, then you're, then what happens? It's weird. He tells them what happens. What's going to happen is then you're going to turn to idols. Then you're going to turn completely to idolatry. We see this in the world, people. We see it in the world all the time. That's not a picture of a blessed man or woman. The blessed man or woman knows that God gave them everything they have and they walk in a humility about it. There's a humility about it that God gave me everything I have and it's all due to Him. If I woke up tomorrow and had nothing, I'd still be blessed because I have Jesus in my heart and we'll do it again, Lord. Come on, if I woke up, you can bless God in a two-room shack or a 40-room mansion. Or you can be a miser and a tightwad in a two-room shack or a 40-room mansion. It's the condition of your heart that makes the difference. Come on, somebody. And he says, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant. The purpose behind blessings and the purpose behind wealth is that His covenantal promises would be established in Israel. I'm blessing you so the next generation can carry it on. I'm blessing you so the next generation can carry it on. I'm blessing you so the next generation will know the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and we call upon Him, and we keep His commandments. The next generation shall know Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and we keep His covenants and commandments. The next... On and on. And then into the New Testament comes the ultimate fruition, the ultimate fulfillment of the covenantal promises to Abraham. And that is, unto us a son is born. Unto us a child is given. The increase of his government shall never know an end. He shall be called wonderful, counselor, everlasting father, prince of peace. This is the one named Jesus. And in him is the totality of all the covenantal promises being fulfilled. And now you and I are in him and now we have blessings and favor because we're in him and now our job is to be blessed that we might establish his covenant and make him famous and let his name and his good news and his gospel be known to the ends of the earth Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached for a witness unto all nations and then the end shall come if you want a sign of the end times it's the gospel being preached to all nations that the unreached tribes can hear that the islands of the sea can hear that they can hear the good news the good news is to a sinner you don't have to be bound by sin anymore hallelujah the good news is to a sick person you don't have to be sick anymore the good news is to a natural man I have a supernatural God who can come and give you dreams and revelations I have to those who are living a, a, a bad subpar life the good news is God can come and redeem and lift your society and bless you and you can have businesses and you can start your own missionary endeavors. This is what it means to be blessed. That we bless the nations. That we sow into the nations. Hallelujah. I have given you, son, the nations as your inheritance. He says to the Messiah in the book of Psalms. And now we are living as this, this, this blessed people to be able to bless everyone we come in contact with. Bless the nations of the earth to see Jesus Jesus come, redeem, and save, and heal, and bless. Come on, somebody. Come on, give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Come on, give him a praise. Hallelujah. 
You know, my, I, 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 I traveled years ago with, with an evangelist named Mike Shreve, and he's been here many times. And Mike, Mike used to say something all the time. He said, if you've been set free from something, you earn the right to set somebody else free of it. So, this, so, so the blessing never ends. The blessing never ends. If you've made your way through grief and you've been set free from it, you can help somebody else on that journey and get them set free because he bore our griefs and sorrows. If you've been bound by alcoholism and you've been set free from it, you have the right to come up along somebody else and say, listen, man, been there, done that. You don't have to live like that. If you've been set free from sexual addiction and God set you free and washed you in the blood of Jesus and broke that power off your life, you can go to some other men and say, hey, man, you don't have to watch porn. It's subpar to how God wants you to live. You don't have to commit adultery. That's not God's best for you because it's going to wreck your life. The Bible says the reproach of adultery never leaves. It's going to wreck your life. There's going to be a stamp of reproach on your life the rest of your life, and you're going to wreck somebody else's family. It's you're living subpar. It's not the blessed favor. You, you, you being promiscuous before marriage, I'm just getting down preaching holiness now. Is that all right? You being promiscuous before marriage isn't the best for you because you're going to take into marriage all those images and all of those nights and all those days and all those people you hurt. And I know God forgives and God sanctifies, but the memories remain that you'll have to deal with for the rest of your life. And I'm preaching better than your amen. And right now, that's not the best, young kids. It's not the best for you. It's not the best life for you. Hallelujah. Your best life is not sitting on TikTok 10 hours a day taking in garbage from the world. Your best life is not having to see the next Netflix special or you're going to lose your ever living mind. No, that isn't your best life. There's philosophy you could be reading. There's history you could be reading. There's the Bible you could be into. You could be in a prayer group somewhere. Come on. I'm just going to preach it like this because it goes with prosperity. I want you to live the best life possible. I want you to live a best life, uh, the blessed life. Come on, a life of favor. I want God's best for you. Hallelujah. You know, I'm telling you what, I'm just to this point now, I have questions when I give it over to glory, but right now I'm taking the book over my experience, and I'm telling you, I believe we all should be healed. I believe we all should be filled with the Holy Ghost. I believe we all should be living to the best that God wants us to live. I don't believe sickness and disease should have a part of our lives. I just don't. It's in the Bible. He heals all your diseases, and He forgives all of your iniquities, and He crowns your life with loving kindness. I believe we're to live long lives and bless the next generation and the next generation. Hallelujah. We should be, our living should be the floor for the next generation and your kids. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Okay, you know what my heart's desire is? I have two grandsons, Mav and Lucas. And my, I grew up never knowing what it was like to see someone pray in tongues or move in the power of God. I'd learned that. I got in the church at 16 and I learned it. But I never knew it from a young boy. Now, my mama was a great woman. She taught me how to pray. My grandparents were great people praying me into the kingdom. But I want these boys to see miracles by the time before they go to preschool. I want them to hear praying in tongues before they go to preschool. Like Alex, she was praying in tongues one night at four years old. And me and my wife looked at each other and we're like, what is, is that real? The whole family, we all looked at each other and said, is it real? And we just had to conclude it was real because she'd been raised under it. We prayed in the Holy Ghost over her in the womb. Hallelujah. This is what I'm talking about. The next generation doesn't have to wake up, will walk in the dearth of the miraculous that you and I maybe grew up in. They can know the miraculous. They can walk at the next level. And because we're walking in these blessings, they're going to receive the overflow of those blessings. Come on, somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. God blessed Adam and Eve, gave them abundance. God blessed them and they told, God told them, go take dominion. God blessed Abraham. He lived in abundance. He had so many blessings, he and Lot had to part ways. Then he had to go get Lot. He had to go defeat five kings. He had to raise up the next generation because of the blessings of God. God blessed Israel as a prototype missionary nation to show the world what it looks like for a people to walk under the canopy of God's blessing and favor. And then they produced the man Jesus himself. And now the whole world has been blessed 
for eternity because of the coming of Christ. And now you and I are here under the shadow of His blessing, under the shadow of the wings of the Almighty. Hallelujah. We're living under that blessing of Jesus Himself. Even His name, Mashiach, means the one smeared with oil, the one oiled down, the one given the favor and the anointing of God. I'm telling you what, the church is the firstborn. The church is the firstborn that's made itself up to Mount Zion, Hebrews said, and now we are the ones smeared with the oil of God. Now we are the anointed ones who are to go forth, raise the dead, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, preach the blessing of the kingdom is to come. Come on, when people get around you, they should feel the difference. They should see the joy. They should know the glow that's on your life, that you're a blessed man or you're a blessed woman. This is what it means to be blessed biblically. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Come on, raise your hands with me. Father, we receive the word this morning. We receive the word with joy this morning. And God, I give you praise right now. We receive the word with joy. And God, we know that we are blessed and that we are blessed coming in, going out, in the city, in the field. We choose, Deuteronomy 28, we choose the blessings and not the curses. We choose the blessings and not the curses. Lord, help us to get this revelation that we are blessed to be a blessing. We are blessed to be a blessing. We're blessed to help other people. We're blessed to sponsor the work of the gospel. We're blessed to take the gospel. We're blessed to live the gospel. Father, right now, I just thank you. I thank you for everyone in here this morning who's heard the word. God, and I give you praise. And Lord, I just pray right now you just load us down with your goodness and your favor. And God, maybe there's some in here who've been struggling to see it. I pray they see it clearly this morning in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray they see it clearly right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Is there one person who could raise your hand and say, Pastor, I'm hearing you preach, but I'm not living under the blessing of God. I don't, I don't feel my heart's right, and I want to get my heart right this morning. If that's you, just raise your hand. We're going to pray for you right now. I'm going to pray for you right where you stand. If that's you, thank you, and thank you, and thank you, thank you, thank you. And when there's others, I, I, just, I just need my heart right. I want, I want to receive all the blessings that God has for me. Come on, let's pray. Pray it out loud. Everybody in here, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all sin. Forgive me when I've been a bad steward of the things you've given me. And God, I repent of it. Come on, say it out loud. I repent of it. I, I walk away from it now. And I turn my walk I turn my eyes toward you. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. I open up my heart to everything you have for me. I open up my heart to your goodness, to your favor, to your forgiveness. And God, I give you praise right now for touching my life. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And we give you praise. Come on, if you believe God did something in your heart, give him a hand clap of praise right now. Come on, just give him a hand clap of praise. Come on, give him a shout hallelujah this morning. Oh, hallelujah. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching and listening to the podcast. And I hope these sermons have been a great blessing and source of encouragement to your life. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing today, Jesus is the answer. I can tell you, He is the answer for your life. I'd love to pray with you before we leave here. So if you never accepted Christ into your life, or if you just have a need in your life, let's lift it up to the Lord right now. Come on, pray with me. Lord Jesus, wash me from all sin. I accept you into my life. I repent of all sin, and I place you on the throne seat of my heart. Lord, I pray right now, you minister to each and every one who just prayed that short prayer with me. Whatever situation they're facing, give them grace right now. Give them the power they need to get through it, Lord. Give miracle signs and wonders today, Lord, to those listening in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We declare it done in Jesus' name. Love you guys. Thank you for tuning in and listening and watching us.